Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Deidre Dane. I'm the Senior Advisor for Programs and Partnerships, and I'll be today's conversation moderator. On behalf of Dr. Tia Dole, our Executive Director, who couldn't be with us today, I want to welcome you to today's community conversation. Today's event represents the wide array of relevant issues and topics the Steve Fund addresses to actively support the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color and their intersectional identities. As background, the Steve Fund was founded in 2014 and is the nation's leading social impact organization that specifically serves young people of color as they transition through adolescence into young adulthood by raising awareness, expanding knowledge and practice, and enhancing long-term thriving. Please visit us at stevefund.org to learn about all our activities. We're very pleased to provide this venue for a discussion about an historic, indeed, and a current topic that of how religious intolerance impacts our mental health. I'd like to thank Peloton for their support in bringing this program to you today. And because of the nature of the topic, our presenters will discuss their perspectives in conversational fashion. We hope that this format will be more engaging and inviting for your comments and participation. I'm going to first describe today's session um, as a discussion among um, preeminent uh, specialists in the field of mental health and religion and spirituality, and hopefully raise some awareness around the nuances of the topic at hand. Our learning objectives today include identifying the connection between culture and sense of well-being and religious preference, understanding that sort of intersection, describing how historical trauma related to religious intolerance affects current well-being and mental health, explaining the importance of language in the context of racial, cultural, and religious identity. And we really hope for your all's engagement as participants today. We greatly value your input as we hold this conversation. We want to encourage you to please put questions in the Q&A and any comments in the chat. We'll be doing this as we go through today's conversation um, rather than hold a separate Q&A at the end. So please do feel free to either address a specific presenter or make general comments or questions. We also ask that you participate in some of the polls that we will produce, we will be presenting to you today. They will pop up throughout our conversation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenters by name and each of them will then give um, their own backgrounds in just a couple of minutes so that you get to know them um, before they start talking. First, Dr. Farha Abbasi is with us. Next, Reverend Dr. Will Willard Ashley, Dr. Pooja Chadha, Rabbi Diana Gerson, and Sarah Menard. And I'm going to now pass, I'm gonna start with Dr. Abbasi and ask you to just give us a couple of minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Thanks. Thank you so much. First of all, it's been an amazing journey with Steve Fund. 
and the great work they are doing and all the toolkits and all the programming. It's just been such a huge resource for uh, students of color and faculty of color. At, so I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Michigan State University. And uh, I also uh, identify as a cultural psychiatrist. And uh, I was able to um, kind of work on uh, mental health issues in the faith-based communities, interfaith and intrafaith communities. And uh, that's where my work around Muslim mental health uh, started. So I have a conference, uh, annual conference, Muslim mental health conference, which is in its 15th year and a journal of Muslim mental health. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reverend Dr. Willard Ashley. And again, I echo the thoughts and prayers as well, and I'm just glad to be part of this conversation. So I have three professional identities, uh, Black Baptist pastor for 40 years, uh, certified licensed psychoanalyst, and a retired pr professor of practical or pastoral theology. <clears throat> and so I didn't have any choice to do this work. Um, it's in my DNA. When your cousin is number 42, Jackie Robinson, you're gonna do this kind of work. When you're related to Sally Hemings as a cousin, you're gonna do this kind of work. Um, and so it's part of my DNA since I can walk, since I can remember, I've always been involved in this kind of work has been my passion. It's cost me dearly at times, but I enjoy the work and will continue to do it until I know have, have no more breath in this body. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Chadha. Hello, everyone, and it's an honor to be here with Steve Fund and to be with you all. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I am also a psychiatrist by trade. I work at UC Davis in California, and I wear multiple hats. Um, I'm an associate uh, clinical professor, so I work in a community mental health clinic. Um, it's my honor to teach and serve in that setting. I also work with the critical communication on cultural humility in all that we do within healthcare and healthcare education. Specifically, what we found is that it's really hard to have these conversations. Um, and so we've come up with tools that actually we found work in how to navigate the difficult conversations, microaggressions, privilege, bias, harm related to all of those. My lived experience is as a um, Punjabi Hindu whose family was displaced by colonialism. And we have traveled through Africa and here. I'm also, I identify as being in a family. My better half um, is of mixed race background, including black. And we have three beautiful children. We are trying to raise as best possible. He identifies as Christian, myself as Hindu. And we've navigated that and we're trying to bring up our children in an environment that honors their diverse backgrounds, but also helps them navigate the challenges that come up. It's my honor to be here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Chadha. Next, um, Doc, Rabbi Diana Gerson. Thank you so much, Deidre, for putting this all together. And thank you to uh, Reverend Dr. Ashley for introducing me to Deidre. And I am just so blessed and filled with gratitude to be with so many esteemed colleagues is truly a robust panel and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I am a reform rabbi. I was ordained here in New York City in 2001. For the last 18 years, I've been serving as the Associate Executive Vice President to the New York Board of Rabbis, which is about 750 rabbis, if you can imagine all of them trying to get along. Uh, but we are of diverse backgrounds. Myself, I am third generation American uh, and at the same time come from a very mixed and diverse Jewish background. Uh, I have family members who are Orthodox rabbis, ultra Orthodox rabbis. I also am part Ashkenazi, I am part Mizrahi, and I am part Romaniot, which means uh, I come from a lot of different backgrounds and traditions, and even within my own community, sometimes people are like, you're what? And what does that mean? So I know that identity is something that is something that we all struggle with in all of our different capacities. In a secondary uh, yarmulke that I wear, I also 
work within the New York Board of Rabbis context as an NGO, a non-government organization of the United Nations, where I work alongside other faith-based NGOs from around the globe. Uh, and my third yarmulke really is a, is a PhD candidate at VU Amsterdam, where I am doing research in the area of moral injury as a subset of PTSD and looking at community readiness of clergy across the board to really address what this means within a communal context. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And um, last but certainly not least, Sarah Menard up in Connecticut. Yes, that's right. I'm up in Connecticut where it, half of the year it's cold, but it's about 90 degrees today. So I'm glad I'm inside in the AC um, with all of you. Thank you for having me. Um, and allowing me to be in this conversation that's extremely important and for everyone who's participating and joining with us today. Um, as Deirdre said, my name is Sarah Menard and I'm born, born and raised in Connecticut um, by two Haitian immigrant parents. I am first generation, I'm Haitian American. Um, my religious tradition is American Baptist, but within a Haitian immigrant based context. Um, I was Catholic school educated my entire life, worked at a Catholic school school for six years, and I'm currently pursuing a Master of Divinity at Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. And what brings me to this work is my professional background is in social work, um, both in clinical social work and community social work. And I'm extremely interested in the intersection of mental health and theology and how that is demonstrated practically through religion. Um, I have been a Christian educator for many years and realized is that um, working with children and with youth, um, they throughout the generations, um, it, it's, it's important for us to have these real life conversations with them, especially being a bridge between my parents' generation and the generation that's um, being raised today. And I'm really hoping that with my lived experience, my education, um, my privilege, and my interest to uplift my culture um, as a Haitian descendant, um, to be able to have these tough conversations um, regarding religion and the pain and trauma that religion has caused, caused historically, even within our culture, um, being Protestant, but having been Catholics who educated, there's a lot of harm that's been done and is still being done um, regarding these two faith backgrounds because there's a lot that we just don't understand. So I'm looking forward to leaning into that discomfort um, together with others and hoping to look forward to how religion can help heal and um, do less harm. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent, thank you so much, Sarah. It's really, as you all can see, we've got a a great, very stimulating um, group of um, presenters with us today. And um, to get started, as we, as we get started, I'd like to um, turn the, um, the mic over to Dr. Chadha, who is going to take us through briefly our community check-in, which we want to do just to provide some um, background and sort of agreements um, and understandings as we enter this, as we entered this work today, this, this topic. Dr. Chadha. Thanks so much, Deidre. And um, from going forward, if anyone wants to pose any questions, Pooja is fine with me. I really want to um, thank you all for being here on behalf of um, the C Fund and also asking you to lean in. These are difficult conversations that we just mentioned, but we really want to highlight a couple of things. The first is, this is, this is not a, unfortunately not a surrogate for therapy, but we do have the resources to your left that we really, um, to your right, I'm sorry, that we hope you um, take advantage of. There's National Alliance of Mental Illness, a phenomenal resource. There is the Steve Fund text line, as well as the National Suicide Hotline, you can call or text. Um, and also there, there's so many important values to navigating um, mental health and we wanna promote that. We want you through this discussion and onwards to prioritize your, mental health. And we really want to invite you into self-care. If you need to pause while you're attending this, if someone says something that is um, really charged for you, because we are in a charged nation right now, we invite you to take the space you need and also reach out to any of us, um, the moderators, to get support. Um, we'll have resources if you need it at the end. But we also wanted to lean into some agreements as we discuss these difficult topics. 
The first is that let's listen to each other with an open mind. And um, let's also speak mindfully. Um, I'm gonna try and honor the space with others and share it. Um, and remember, we need to protect that stories are shared here. And maybe we can take the learning from those stories, but leave the names behind and honor confidentiality. The last thing is, I'm a psychiatrist by trade, so it would be amiss if I didn't say that sometimes when we talk about these topics, it can trigger um, an emotional response. For me, it's an ugh right here. And when we feel that ugh, there's a, a decision point we reach where we may wanna just walk away for many reasons that can be legitimate. Or in that moment, if you're able to, lean in with curiosity and reserve the right to change your mind. Thanks so much, Deidre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're gonna get started following our agreement. And if anybody has any comments or questions, please, again, put them in the chat. To get our conversation going, I'm going to ask everyone a, a, uh, a baseline question. When we think about our religious, how our religious beliefs are formed, we might consider the extent to which they're part of us feeling at home. So I'd like to ask what that means to you. What is home for you? How is that defined? In other words, another way of, of, of looking at it is what part of home does religion play for you? So I'm going to turn it to Sarah first to provide the first response and, and in um, fact, give us sort of a context for how we might proceed. Sarah? Thank you, Deidre. So as you all see the question and um, hopefully you're able to locate it in the chat and also see the uh, question that's coming up through the poll, um, I would uh, initially answer this question by saying that um, home, it, to be very mindful of the language of home, um, because we all define home differently. And home um, from the onset might be defined by most people by geographic location. location. Um, but I'd like to say, um, especially in regards to our, to our conversation about religious development, is that home is, um, is where we embody all of our senses. For me, home is a, a, a smell, it's a sense, it's a taste. Um, things for me feel like home. I know what home looks like because it's not attached to a place. And um, specifically as a daughter of Haitian immigrants, um, home for me sometimes feel like a middle place, a place that I am still discovering um, what that looks like and what that feels like. And um, regarding our conversation regarding religion, I that resonates a lot with me because religion is something that we are, we are introduced to um, as children before we have an opportunity to, to choose and to decide. And as we develop, as we go through the stages of life, we determine how faith, how religion, how spirituality shows up for us, how we want to engage with it. And I feel the same way about home. Um, I feel the same way about home because for me, home is where I can create community that looks, smells, tastes, feels, sounds like how I define home. And as a Haitian American, a descendant of Haitians and being a Haitian American, home is comprised of these two different cultures. Um, so that's that's where I'll stop right now. And I'm sure it'll come up a little bit more um, in the conversation. Great, so who else would like to? So um, I can uh, go next. Uh, so I am a practicing Muslim and presence of God is, uh, is very omnipotent, like all around, within um, and outside. But um, when I think of my identity, uh, of course, my religious identity is a very important part of it. To me, why I consider my faith as my home is home is where you can feel secure safe, secure, and have a relationship of trust where you can share your fears and you can sit and hope for a future. 
And to me, faith embodies all that. Um, but that also as a mental health provider brings me to the concept that you might be born into one religion, but you might not share that kind of comfort in being in that religion. So as a physician, clinician, I have started understanding that there is one part is practiced religion and other part is spiritual religion. So religion, one thing is set of beliefs and one is set of practices. So we all lie on a spectrum of where our spirituality is and where our religiosity is. But I think the most important question becomes, is religion, spirituality, presence of God, a source of healing or a source of distress? Because if your relationship is not symbiotic or healthy or validating, you could feel that then any crisis becomes a spiritual crisis as well. Yeah, Chris Argus at MIT expressed what you were saying as well, talking about your espoused theory versus your actual practice theory. And you could substitute the word religion for that as well. And so I, I think I went through a period of feeling homeless because I grew up Roman Catholic initially. And so I went through all, all, all the throes of Roman Catholicism and so forth and so on. And I remember, I think I want to say it was probably through Rabbi Gerson that once I met met the Cardinal who says, you're going to come back one day. <laughs> it's like, okay. okay. Um, and I remember when I became Baptist, I had to be baptized again. They said, you know, it didn't count the first time around. Like, when you know, it didn't count. Oh, no, because it's, it's it's different now. Like, oh, okay, fine. So having to submit submit to that. And even though I've been uh, Baptist for 40 years now, there's still parts of Catholicism that I embrace. And, you know, I have to say, shh, can't say that because you're the Baptist minister now, but <laughs> it, it's true. <clears throat> um, and I wonder one day when I retire, I'm not the one doing the sermons on the weekends, where I'm going to end up, you know, back to Catholicism or some somewhere in some Protestantism or, or not not quite sure. But, you know, it's it, it, it's hard for me to hear the word home. And I think of Stephanie Mills singing The Wiz and, and that closing in, 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 in the play. And when I think of home, you know, I do think of a place where there's love ever flowing and, and, that, and that's a reality. So be it in my physical home or in my congregational home, where I've been pastor there with one people for 26 years and some even longer, that feels like home because you can be yourself unapologetically and they get you, quote unquote. I'm thinking about what you are all saying. And I sometimes, Sarah, you spoke about the different senses. And I think that the senses are really so profound. Um, yeah, there is practice and there is faith and they're very different. And sometimes they jive together and sometimes they really don't. I'm always struck by, remember coming home from school in the, usually in the fall, and I would smell my mom baking in the kitchen. And it was a sign that Rosh Hashanah was coming. Like just that smell of apples and honey and spices, and that was home. And I can be walking through a marketplace anywhere in the world. And if I smell apples, it's a sense of home. That it takes you in that nostalgia back to that time and place where you felt so connected. And what's remarkable to me is that wherever I travel, I love to go to different houses of worship. I love to go to sacred spaces. I love to go to synagogues and mosques and temples, historic sites, archeological sites, um, because there are certain things that bring out that sense of connectivity. So while I can be sitting in a mosque in, in Abu Dhabi and feel this tremendous sense of home, I don't understand the prayer, but I understand the heart. The essence. It, it is, there's something that speaks to you. I remember sitting in Notre Dame as a young 
gosh, 25 years ago. And feeling that sense of home and peace and comfort as I was trying to make a big decision in my life. That going as a child and sitting in my own home congregational sanctuary, because I was regularly, you know, wander out of Hebrew school classes and I would wander into the sanctuary. And if you weren't sure where I was, it was usually there sitting on the pulpit, kind of sitting under that, that eternal light, kind of trying to figure things out. That was home. And that can exist anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so really God and faith and practice and home is all wherever your heart is. At least that has been my experience. And I love that that can be anywhere and yet it is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it, I think if we honor that, when I honor that, it may, it's transformative. And, and just to build off of the, the conversation that's going so far, um, I, I want to add that it's okay if it's messy. Uh -huh. um, and speaking of messy, um, I live that um, as a Punjabi Hindu married to a Christian husband who grew up in England where at public schools, it's normal to inquire, go certain church services at Christmas. It can be messy. And my mother was a lover of many different cultures. And the, the misnomer is that Hinduism is one religion. It's actually many that colon, um, colonizers came over and said, oh, these are all same people by this Hindus river, they're Hindus. So <laughs> it's messy and it's okay that it's messy. And I also have been grounded that it's okay to have space that individuals take interpretation, that there are some common norms and values that resolute across. Mm -hmm. But I also want to be grounded that I don't always know the journey of others. I'm sure I'm speaking to the group um, and those of you who are joining us today, um, I want to acknowledge some of you may appreciate lived experiences of being persecuted for religion and we know the common ones. But I also want to add some sects of Hinduism within cities in Europe were forbidden to practice and um, incarcerated while pregnant and their child taken away from them. So it happens in all different sectors. And what I do see is this common thread that there are some common values. And I'm, I appreciate what everyone's saying about spirituality. Because um, in a home, how do you honor faiths and how do two um, different cultures have different definitions, but how do two families wed? And then I also want to be grounded to sexual identity um, and add space that sometimes it's hard, it's, it's harder to feel at home to something that we've grown up being grounded to or we're given mixed messages. And I think each human, my bias is that each human is inherently good. And um, having been someone who a, um, a religious person would not marry because I wasn't equally yoked, I, I just wanna appreciate that space too. And I still love my, my spirituality and faith in spite of the journey. In fact, maybe even more so because of you it more yep. i also so it's it's a very interesting uh, that you all bring this up uh, so first of all in my background i went to catholic schools all my life so that kind of uh, innate sense of comfort with other in within other religions and faith practices was ingrained in me early on. So we, we were surrounded by nuns and their habits and fathers and sisters. So really exposed to that uh, kind of values. Um, but also, I also feel that if we go with the essence of any faith or religion, the essence is very same the same values are being taught. So it's literally paths to the same summit. And the summit in the end is all about humanity. So how do we serve humanity? How we find our innate humanity? How do we respond to other people's humanity? How we respect that and appreciate that? So to me, that's faith, that's spirituality, that's religion.
you know, I often use a uh, an analogy of the bicycle wheel when I talk about uh, religion, especially doing comparative religion, interfaith work. We often tend to feel very uh, distant from one another. We sit down in a room together. We may not have the same foods. We may not have the same background. We don't have the same practice. We don't pray in the same language. We have different names for God. And it all feels very foreign. But if we all are sitting kind of on that outer rim of the bicycle wheel mm -hmm. and we follow our own spoke, right? The spokes don't touch one another necessarily along their path, their journey, that we have all of our different practices. And whether we grew up in one faith and changed faith or were exposed to another faith or schooled in other faiths. And I went to public schools and I saw every faith. Um, I grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey. It was an amazing multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic um, experience. And I got to go to everybody's different practice and try everybody's different food and pray in each other's houses of worship. And that was incredible, uh, which I thought always made me much stronger in my own faith and practice. But if we all follow that spoke, if we get to the very center of the wheel, we're, what seems so far apart is actually very close together. Now we're shoulder to shoulder. Now the center, that's God, whatever you call God, whether you call God, God, you see God as almighty, omnipotent, whether you see God as a life force or an energy, um, we can all interpret that our own way. But when we're there together at the summit, I used to say Farah, is really that idea that we are all there for the same common purpose. It's about love, it's about honor, it's about dignity, it's about respect. Um, in the 1970s, I had those great t-shirts. I don't remember, maybe we're not all old enough uh, in the group that's attending uh, to remember the 70s, but you can probably find that at a vintage shop, these t-shirts that you say, God don't make no junk. Anybody remember this? Grammatically incorrect. My mother wouldn't let me have one. I was very disappointed. But the idea is, is that we are all created in the divine image. If God put us on this planet, if we were, we were able to be born and breathe life into our lungs, then we are by very, very, that very, you know, fact, like Pooja said, you know, we are good. We are, we are, we have dignity because we are created in the divine image. So we have to find our own spoke and maybe we change spokes, but we can all honor that and come closer together. That's the goal. It should be the goal. I would hope that's our goal. What about the difference? Somebody has um, asked the question, the, the difference between religion and spirituality and understanding that they really are quite different terms. How do we differentiate between those two terms in this conversation? I think we tend to think of religion as more ritualistic. Right. In, in that regard, rituals and practices with spirituality can be everywhere, anywhere. And um, I think sometimes in some of our circles, it's hard to communicate that to our congregants that it's okay they get stuck and it's religious, like, okay. And, you know, so I say spirituality and go, it goes to that seminary stuff. You know, we don't do, we don't do that here. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so I think for me that that's, that's the difference. And so I go to walk the dog and by the way, I'm a current resident of Teaneck. So I go walk the dog in Volte Park and I feel I'm having a spiritual moment between the grass and the trees and dog barking and the deer and so forth. And it's a spiritual moment. And at that particular time, the rabbis speak, the imams speak, and everybody's in this one space where we're all talking to each other. Now, once we leave the park, that may change. I, I get that. But at least during that moment, it's kind of a spiritual moment where, where God comes together with all of creation and we're on the same page or as Diana said, you know, we've got that, that spoke, so to speak, and it's working. And I always remember <clears throat> when, when, when I see Rabbi Gerson um, going to see our dear friend, uh, Rabbi Joe Potasnik, during Christmas time and having had a conversation and I'm leaving and he says, by the way, Will, Merry Christmas. And I, my neck almost breaks, I go, huh? He goes, Will, he was our guy first. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's Joe, I know. <laughs> I want to also answer that question. Um, I, it's 
a question that I find that always comes up in different circles. And sometimes I feel like the answer changes because I, I, I sense that religion is subscribing to a way of beliefs that is already written, but spirituality is, um, is a way that is still being created and imagined. Um, and it's not limited to our sacred texts and our faith backgrounds that are historical. Um, and I find there's a tension there that oftentimes we, I find with people and even myself sometimes with the language, like I'm not religious, I, I'm spiritual, but don't really always know what that means, but I can be both, you know, I can be very religious um, and whatever that means and looks like, it'll be different on Monday versus on Thursday, but I'm also spiritual because I am a spirit being um, and I'm religious because I'm a human being. And I believe that religion is something that is, is created by human beings, but spirituality encompasses all of creation and whatever creation is to whomever um, is speaking, then it includes more of what is to come as well. Because I believe religion does not evolve, but spirituality can evolve. Yeah. I also um, want to talk about the practice and what I sometimes feel practice is important. We all need, uh, because we need those per parameters to have some discipline, right? Uh, to give some, some kind of sensibility, tangibility of the religion. So spirituality is emotional feeling sense. Uh, your perception and then practice is what makes it more tangential that like uh, in uh, Islamic faith, praying five times, ablution and all that kind of then grounds the what you know, what you feel, what you think that that's you implement in your practice. But the, I think what concerns me is with the religious practices also then we see scrupulosity that people get so wedded to the ritualistic practice of the religion that they tend to walk away from the spirit of the religion. And that's where we see this uh, intolerance comes in. And intolerance can be, I feel intra and in, within your faith or interfaith or within bigger society. But this scrupulosity also makes you feel like holier than thou, like I'm, I'm a better practice Muslim or I'm better Christian and, uh, than the rest of you. So I think uh, for me, it has always been about finding that balance that practice might be the ultimate like way of expressing certain things, but it always has to be connected to the basic essence and feelings, which is your faith. So I think I think of faith as God's relationship to me, spirituality is my relationship to God. And then the practice is uh, kind of like, you know, we say love is also action. So that that's where the practices come in. But the what I feel with the trauma in the religion comes from is when the practices take over the spiritual part of it. And I'm kind of muddling through it myself too. I want to invite the um, attendees to chime in on the Q&A what your definition is. Um, I'm not sure that these have to be set in stone. My muddling through is similar to what others are saying, but um, I would say from a, a basic standpoint, religion may be creating a culture, um, maybe historically based or ritualized and normed like others, but it, it can create a sense of belonging to a specific group or members who identify as also being part of that same religion. So it's a sense of belonging. And I think that's where Dr. Abbasi is alluding to um, area for intolerance. And then in my sense of things, and mine might not be correct, I welcome others to chime in, but um, faith, maybe more individualistic, that we're allowed to create our sense of what we truly believe. And it may be an amalgam of multiple things we have lived experiences where they're learning. So even within one um, religious background, like we're saying like, um, I don't wanna butcher names because I'm not the expert, but you know, 
Protestant versus Catholic or within even um, like um, Shiite Muslim versus other, um, Hare Krishna Hindu versus other. You know, there's so many different sects and divisions that then your sense of belonging is could be very much intersectional. And I want to acknowledge that too. Mm -hmm. USA Today published a report about two years ago that said most of us practice two religions. There's the Mm -hmm. one that we say that we outright own. Then it's kind of when we kind of closet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And that's a um, good segue actually to sort of understanding a bit more about this connection between um, our religions and the, the lack of belonging that people might feel as a result of religious intolerance and when your religion gets attacked. And that intolerance, we might ask a couple of questions. And Farha, Dr. Abbasi, you started discussing this. What does religious intolerance mean to you? And how might our religious upbringing and other perhaps conversion experiences um, Will, you were talking about though, you know, your, your ch- conversions, um, how might they provide strength or cause distress, your transitions between your Catholic upbringing into the Baptist tradition? Sort of what was that like? You know, wh- what was the uh, emotion like? And then of course, today we certainly have so much Um, turbulence and chaos and violence, downright violence um, occurring because of religious intolerance and just that not understanding. What what does this all mean? And this is where it might get um, a bit uncomfortable for some of our attendees. So we wanna remind you of um, Puja's original um, safety guidelines. I would like to build on what Dr. Chada said that if practiced religion gives you that sense of belonging and commonness and uh, sharing similar values, it, ca- it has the potential to cause otherization as well. So that's why I was talking about religious practices, scrupulosity and spirituality that it is very easy to get in the mold that I know the best, I'm doing the best, so I am the best. Um, I see that uh, intolerance has a very damaging impact on your mental health. And why is that? Because anyhow, when you belong to a religion, there are two things we we get very frequently exposed to, especially in in the ritualistic settings, is culture of guilt and culture of shame. So guilt is you forever feel you are failing God and shame is that you're forever failing the community or your faith community. So when we uh, kind of have this image of a punitive God or have a community very kind of validating or invalidating you on based off your practices, um, could be your everyday practice, could be your marriage, could be your sexual or gender identity. So the intolerance can feel, can have very deep uh, impact on your psyche. Um, But when we put it in the setting of intra-communities, intra-faith or what right now as a practicing Muslim, um, I uh, am, we are going through every day, just hearing things like um, a family being trampled, like, you know, um, in Canada, when the, a family going out for walk was uh, somebody drove over them, killed four people, that, that, that vicarious trauma, that uh, uh, trauma by association, but then the fear of how visible I can be in my faith. So it's such a multiple level of trauma that we are seeing that I would say we have gone a step further or, you know, these police shootings or um, what we see impact of long-term ingrained racism or structural racism. We have very rich data there. We, We know how it impacts cognition, identity, 
your sense of being, your relationships, your career choices, it has long lasting impacts. And I think it deeply disturbs me when uh, people say so in, like so many Sikhs were attacked or other uh, Asians were attacked because they looked Muslim. So, um, you know, it's, uh, what does it mean to be a Muslim? What's, how, how are people's relationship with someone other's uh, religion and faith? That, those are the questions, you know, that uh, I get very affected by. Um, I want to use this space to just um, give some um, honoring to that biases can be triggered by how we honor our sense of being related to religion, spirituality, and faith. If we have certain dress, certain uh, um, like carrying, perhaps um, uh, you call them, some people call them prayer beads or, um, or we call them japa beads, or if you have certain jewelry or hijab or turban, they can all trigger biases from others. But if we also take a step further, how we express our sexual identity, which is inherent and part of who we are, may actually trigger a lack of sense of belonging from our own religious mm -hmm. background. Yes. And I just wanna create space to honor that. Not too. For me, intolerance is the opposite of exercising cultural humility. Cultural humility is where we're grounded in understanding individuals, honoring that they are, they belong and that they're here and we are also human. And in that we can try to work to understand each other, may not always agree, but we can honor our differences. And I think what I've, um, in my practice as a psychiatrist, um, want to honor that is very challenging and I don't have perfect answers to, is when someone is part of a religious face that they, religious background that they really identify with, but have been told by individuals from that background that because they are doing, marrying out of religion would be myself, or because they're aligning with who they are, which may include um, transition and gender, they are then not accepted in a group that they were at one point in, in group two. And it may also tie into generational understandings and openness, but I just want to leave space for that here today. And one of, one of, one of my lies, I was what was called a, a supervisor for clinical pastoral education, where we train, train chaplains how to, how to be chaplains in a hospital setting or in a prison setting. And I found one of the most difficult didactics was sharing with interfaith clergy, it's okay not to sign your prayer in your traditional closing signature. Mm. So let's say, you know, and, da, 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 and in the name of Jesus, it's okay not to say, it's okay to say in the name of all that's holy or something that's more neutral. And I remember having in, in each summer, having major fights with folks, no, I've got to sign it this way and going through the rituals of, you know, trying to say, well, will the prayer not count if you don't, if you don't sign it in such a certain way. And that was always that was always one of those parts of one of the didactics. I always regret it, regret it, like oh, dread it. Like here we go, we gotta have this conversation, and it's gonna be difficult. And usually, at some point, the students recognized that it was okay. But just those first couple of weeks of just saying it was okay not to sign it in your traditional fashion and make it more neutral was it was a struggle. <laughs> hmm. What about the? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to add, as I know, um, Pooja, you're bringing up the importance of um, sexual identity and how that's it is part of our being. We show up in religious spaces and sacred spaces in our within our sexual identity, whether it is closeted for safety reasons or what whatever reason. Um, but I also think that religious intolerance is spiritual intolerance. So to have a level of intolerance for someone's religious beliefs and choices it's to also deny and not accept someone's being um, someone's actual human being their sexual identity um, because so much of it is there we're intersectional beings um, so i i think of that 
religious intolerance is tied as well to sexism, to xenophobia, and being a descendant of Haitian immigrant parents, I really had to and have to continue um, trying to understand the anti vodou campaign that has con that began centuries ago and continues, and it's something that I I observed intra cultural. I observed it within my religious settings, within my family setting. Um, and then as I got older, I saw that it was being exercised by people of other um, backgrounds and, 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 and races. And, but it started within, in, in, within our, our culture. And I wanted to understand where is this um, self-hate coming from? And I believe, Pooja, you mentioned how, you know, colonizers, there is a direct connection, religious intolerance, is rooted in historical acts of violence. It's rooted in um, in in so much historical trauma that because we we don't often talk about, we're focusing on the present. But these things, as a Christian, begins with the acts of missionaries and conversion experiences. My parents both were Catholic, um, and it's kind of like a running joke in the Haitian culture that Protestant parents love to send their kids to Catholic schools, but are very like anti-Catholic. Um, so it, that dissonance that I know that I grew up with, um, it, it was really difficult, but I realized that that's part of the religious development is as we grow, as we develop, especially working with children and youth, how do individuals come to a point where they have agency to decide what religion looks like within their home? You know, where where is that room for religion that we get to create or spirituality or the decision to, to not subscribe, um, because that's also a part of this conversation, I think, as well, um, that people have a choice to say, I choose to not have a faith background. Hmm. And I think with the colonialism, another thing that seeped into religion was patriarchy. So uh, how women and faith have been devalued, and I see it in all the faiths, uh, that how um, it, it's assumed that the men were, were put in charge of uh, religion, faith, and spirituality. So that's another piece that I think we, is important to th consider. Can I throw something out there and see what everyone thinks? So question, do you think it's possible then to separate, um, if you don't have a sense of belonging in a religion, that you're still okay to have your own faith? just kind of throwing it out there. For, for me, I mean, and when and the individuals I've worked with who've had the um, sexual identity challenge to the, the religion that they were born into, their, their um, work through is to connect to their faith. So they have a connection with what, what values they have individually until they can find a group that is more welcoming. It's unfortunate. I wish it wasn't the case, but that is something that has worked for individuals I wanted to throw out there. One of the most powerful sermons I heard was the pastor preacher said, I love God, but I hate church. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning I, I love what it stands for. I love the values, but the way it's practiced, no thank you. And I think there are people that have have that same feeling and are searching. You know, I love the values of what my sacred literature says, but the way I see it practiced and demonstrated, I don't want to be a part of that. <laughs> it's the same tone I usually have of, you know, I go to synagogue and I go, Ugh, that's not the sermon I would have given. Uh, you missed an opportunity, you missed the point. You know, this is an opportunity. Um, and that faith is important to hold on to in spite of sometimes the practice of our community. I, I think that our communities, our congregations, they're deeply, profoundly human. Mm -hmm. They're human places, which is filled with all kinds of, of challenge and difficulty. And, and you know, I, I uh, it's an, a running, not a joke, ha ha, but joke as an ironically, just sadly true. Um, you look at who chooses to be on the congregation or the board of directors or whatever it is. And they're often folks who, it's kind of like my co-op board. 
You know, they're the people who want to keep everybody else out because no one's doing it right. Um, we're the, we own what's right in the practice. Um, some, it's your mother, mother-in-law, your grandmother who says you're not kosher enough. You're not doing <laughs> it right enough. Um, you know, you didn't dive in correctly because you didn't bend at the knee exactly the way you're supposed to with the right Who said? Who said? Yeah. None of our faith, well, our scriptures, our sacred texts may be finite. Somebody decided they were finite. Someone decided that this was the beginning of the end of the book, right? That we weren't going to continue on. The Jews would not have the story of Hanukkah if it hadn't been for the fact that the Christians saved the story of Maccabees, right? Um, so, you know, it's like who decided? And then the practice, we all of our faiths have, have evolved. Nothing has been stagnant since the right. dawn of time. My, I go to services and I, we sing the song of peace, oh say shalom. And if I sing a different tune, they're like, Rabbi, that's not how Moses sang that at Mount Sinai. <laughs> and I'm like, what makes you think that Moses sang this song anywhere? Um, so there is, I think, this, this profound disconnect, this understanding that this, this idea that we hold on to, that this is exactly the way it's supposed to be. I had a conversion student years ago who, you know, converted to Judaism and her first Rosh Hashanah, she was very excited. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. She invited her, her in-laws over to the house. She made this big Rosh Hashanah meal. And she ended the meal with a coconut cake and her mother-in-law just destroyed her Th through a fit. This isn't right. How could you make coconut cake? This isn't, the you just threw everything and Judaism out the window and the mother-in-law left, left the house. And she calls me the next day in tears. The woman in tears, Rabbi, what did I do wrong? I said, what did you do wrong? You did nothing wrong. In Judaism, we have this expression of the minhag hamakom, the minhag or the tradition or custom of the place. That even if the minhag, the tradition or custom is not aligned with the halachic or the religious law, the minhag, the tradition takes precedent. It's more important. So I looked at her, I said, your mother-in-law basically discarded the minhag, the tradition of your house. She is halakhically incorrect. Your tradition takes precedent. You did it right. And from now on, every Rosh Hashanah, you better plan on making that coconut cake if that's what you want it to be. And I think that's just so important. This sense of intolerance is deeply, again, human. And it is, that is not, I believe, what our traditions say. That's not what our sacred texts are all about. It's all about interpretation. You know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Are you a realist? Who are you? How are you reading the text? So if you are religious leader is, is interpreting the text for you, but you've never read them for yourself, you might find there's a lot more room for us or for you at the table. I, 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 and I think that's where we often get really taken afield. We don't, we're not focused on, let's read the text, let's interpret the texts. How many of us have actually sat down and read the whole Bible or your sacred text, whatever it is, um, and, and have that discussion. It's not just about what the pastor says, sorry, Will, but um, you know, it's not just what the imam says, it's not what the rabbi says. It's not, that's not the, that's not the whole story. And who wants to be part of a dead religion? Mm -hmm. Our faiths and our sacred texts should be living, breathing documents. Um, and that way there's room for everyone at the table. Right. And we then have, uh, we have a question. I'm just going to, uh, sorry, interrupt for a minute, just because it's relevant to this 
portion of what we're talking about. What will it take for groups of people who possess negative views against people from different faiths to see themselves as fellow human beings, what you're saying, Rabbi, with those different groups and exhibit the respect, love, and dignity toward them? Is there hope for this vision or is this question naive? There has to be hope. If we don't have hope, where, where, where do you go from here? If we can't write them off and say, well, they're lost forever. It's just the sad part is, is it's not going to happen in a timely fashion that fits into an hour and a half Zoom call. <laughs> I think uh, how I perceive it, uh, I, I, I'm an eternal optimist. I feel like the change will start with each one of us. Uh, I love what Rumi said that when I was young, I was trying to change the world. And as I matured, I started to change myself first. So each one of us, um, I, and I love the recent quote, uh, be it any in, uh, injustice happening around us, we cannot be bystanders. We have to be upstanders. We have to speak up. We have to engage. We have to reach out. And that's how I feel the movement started. Because at the same time where we are seeing more religion, more faith being talked about, I'm also seeing the crimes that are being uh, done in name of religion and faith. Uh, and I also see how the righteous religious person does things with very conviction and think they are doing the right. And we have, a, I don't know how political we can go on this uh, conversation, but just what we saw with Roe versus Wade, right? That it wasn't taken as maternal mental health or maternal health, it became a point of religion contention. So things like that, I think we have to have guards around that. We have to understand that. Um, and also the concept that it's happening to others. So others have de deserved it somehow. And that as long as I'm comfortable, I'm living the life that I want to, that let things happen to the others. I think we have to step away from that kind of thinking. For people, uh, this is another um, question. For BIPOC people, how can we think and work through the grief of religions that were lost during colonization? And I think there's an implication there that there's some mental health um, issues that are going on for a lot of people who have experienced this historically. And these are not isolated incidents. These are these are historic incidents that have come down through the generations. So how can how can we address that grief? I think I learned a lot from being with the Aboriginals in Australia around that question. Mm -hmm. And they said you never let your children forget. And they have structured in into their culture. I want to say it's Friday nights. I may have the, the day wrong. Where we're going to sit down with the children and talk about our history and 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 when you take 40 different tribes and put them in one geographic location say what you learn before doesn't count no you hold on to that and you teach your children that and you never let them forget yeah i i'd like to add to that um and this this is also to answer the previous question is to to try to um connect with with the rest of creation with the land um, because I think uh, in order for people to respect other people's beliefs, it's to also honor that this conversation about home that we're having um, is also religion is connected to where people come from and the, and the land and the earth is part of our religion and our spirituality. Um, and as as a daughter of Haitian immigrants, I'm grateful that I've been able to go back to Haiti and be there in physically be in Haiti. I mean, it's a spiritual experience for me. Um, I feel like I've heard so much about Haiti and I grew up in a Haitian congregation. So the sound of the Haitian Creole language, the smell of our food and just all of it, um, the feeling, the senses of it. But I think holding on to, um, to, to the land, the experience geographically, and also passing, passing on the, the knowledge. 
we are in an information time, historic time, um, doing your job to educate yourself on, on, on that culture and on that, um, that faith background, because I don't believe that our religion it has been lost. I think that there is, we do need to grieve and we need to lament. Um, I think that's a part of mental health and mental illness is that we don't have a space to lament and grieve um, the trauma. But I think if we give ourselves space to do that, um, we can try to, to bring back what was lost um, so that it can be found. I mean, I feel like I'm about to sing Amazing Grace, but um, you know, I, I, I really think that our, um, our religion, our the religion of BIPOC people, will never be lost. Um, that knowledge just hasn't always been passed down, and well, there's and, still time. And I just want to add to what you're saying because it's it's really um, resonating with me. Um, I think whether we're addressing this as an intra-religion or inter-religion, I think we need to be somewhat thoughtful of the process. I think it's individuals all need to upstand and stand with humanness and cultural humility, as well as honoring the journeys that others have been on. So educating myself on harms that my family, my background, my religion has not lived so that I can be grounded. Also honoring if we have leadership roles, we have responsibility to lead that change and have those difficult conversations within our culture. And then I think, um, I hope it's okay, Deidre. I saw another question in the chat, if we can yes, leave please. it. Yes, please. One of the questions that came up was, if you're in a school group, and my, I wasn't sure if that's a school group that's in a religious-based school or a non-religious-based school, but in a religious-based school where they're, it's hard to honor whether or not some religions honor homosexuality or if some have hard and fast lack of tolerance or inclusion um, and how to do that in a school system and how to honor that. And I think um, in that respect, I think it answers this, we need to involve everyone. And if everyone does their part, it's important to speak up if you see a harm and also not letting things be status quo because we need status quo is deep harm. And then helping engage leadership and diversity, equity, inclusion if your school group has diversity, equity, and inclusion, I really want to include them in the conversation for this religion spirituality group on how to have equity and honor that we have differences, but that we can still honor people as humans who belong here in this school. And I think there are ways to do that. Um, I, I'd be interested if that individual wants to reach out I would love to chat more, but that's a really important point. It's very difficult on how to honor spaces while having differences. I was given a lecture at NYU to a group of social workers. So it's really caught me off guard and a social worker raised their hand and said, so I looked at your bio, you're a Baptist minister. Yes, you went to seminary. Yes, I know my CV, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, so how in the world can you have a book with an openly gay rabbi. And he got up and left and said, I can't listen to you, that, that, you, that you're, 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 you're a counterfeit, you're a fake. Um, and you know, I'm not surprised only in that it was a school of social work thinking, you know, this is how social workers are thinking. That's, that to me is, is scary. And then a second experience, uh, one of my dear friends convinced me to go on Fox News in his place and I took a position that was probably not a Fox News position. And I remember the caller calling from Columbus, Ohio. And he says, and I don't understand how you, you, you've you been ordained by God and you're a Baptist minister and you've taken this position on abortion and this position on gay, lesbian, transgender. And he says, you should, you are a disgrace to, 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 the, to the Christian faith. And I went, uh, we disagree in this position does it make me a disgrace because we're not on the same page on this particular position? And I probably shouldn't have asked that question. He went on and on and on and on, and I'm going to call you the president of your congregation. You should be fired. And I'm like, okay, remember where you are. You're on Fox News. You should have expected this. Okay, consider, consider the context. Although I realize in reality, 
that's not limited to quote unquote any particular news organization that that's widespread and that they, they were just bold enough and brave enough to say what others have thought and I've heard in, in other circles. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask this one last question and then I want to turn to providing some tools and strategies because we do have some ideas for, um, for our audience. Um, another question came in. Every uh, religious group has individuals with a spectrum of beliefs. This is sometimes a result of difference in spiritual growth of believers, while at other times it's just a result of the intersectionalities represented in any group. How then do we reconcile what we like about a specific religious group and our identities tied to it and the cringeworthy statements made by some within our quote, household of faith? We take a cup, just a couple of minutes, and respond to that question. Well, I think we we've we've been sharing that throughout this conversation, and I think each 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 the panelists, each of my colleagues, have been sharing that 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 you find those things that you embrace, and it might be a hybrid of you know, I embrace this part of my faith, I embrace this part of somebody else's faith, and because as you said, because of intermarriages, of blended families, etc. Um, I, I welcome this part. I have friends who are, you know, married to Christians, Jewish folks, married to Hindus, I mean, on and on and on. And so you kind of say, how are we going to raise our children? How what are we going to practice? What traditions are going to be dear to us? What holidays will we practice? And how will we practice those holidays, et cetera? I mean, that's a couples therapy conversation that comes up as well, um, quite often. Yeah, and I, I also think it's it's just the reality of, of us being human. We're dynamic, we're not monolithic within any group. Um, and that's okay, just to accept that uh, different religious beliefs, there will be differences within them. And um, even within a house, within a home, all the children will be different. If you have various pets, the pets have different personalities. And to just accept that. Um, and I think that is one of the challenges um, and the harm done with religious intolerance, oftentimes people don't accept that there, there are differences. And, and sometimes that's where it is. And when people can't tolerate differences, um, there, isn't, there isn't room for us to, um, to live and to dwell together. And we all have this one earth to live, uh, live with. Um, and it's okay if it's cringeworthy, um, you know, it is. But that doesn't mean that we have to act on that discomfort and, and cause harm um, because it's different. And I think that's where both in school settings and in religious settings, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to create a principle, some principles of community, some mutual agreements that we may have difference. In fact, even if I had a twin, we would have differences, right? That's just reality um, to be an individual. And I think if we really harness what it means to embody cultural humility, that will embody that actually our differences are what make our community richer if we can honor that we are different, but that we can be respectful in the way that we will um, engage with each other and honor each other's values does not mean we have to agree. And as I'm thinking with my academic hat on, but there is religion, faith, and spirituality interwoven here. And I think we have an incredible opportunity to model that, but also to call people in when there's missteps and offer opportunity to have healthier conversations and navigate through those harms. Then our community might have richer relationships actually. Uh, I think, uh... One area that I feel is uh, where I cringe still is creating an inclusive faith places where sexual gender orientation, intersectionality, interfaith space. I think we all are trying to create that within our own faith practices. Um, so I think trying to create those safe spaces. And when we hear things contrary to that, that's, I think, is where our challenge lies. 
And then just just turning beats in interest of time, um, we do want to sort of present um, and discuss maybe some strategies or tools that people can use when they are or have faced religious intolerance and that sort of discrimination that people feel um, all the time. Um, and then what happens, I know, Pooja, you were talking as we were planning this, there's the occasion when someone who has incurred that harm want, is made aware of it and wants to apologize. And what is that, what is a tool perhaps, and you presented sort of a model or, or an approach for, for how to help people through that experience. So it's sort of two sides, you know, what, what can we do to help people who have, been, who have been harmed? And then what can we do for the people who have caused the harm? I think the first is um, we're trying to model here is creating things for the space, but, um, and anyone chime in, add in, please, you have expertise. Um, the first is to create a, a, a mutual culture of talking about this and that it's okay that we can allow healing. And also the culture that it's not, if I'm borrowing from Dr. Jan Marie Garcia, who helped with Melanie Trimble to coin the term cultural humility, it's not if we make a mistake, it's when. I hope that you will give me the gift of letting me know. So acknowledging that it is a gift when we get it from others that harm has occurred. But sometimes what's easier to identify is if harm happens to us, it can be harder to identify when we're told we're causing harm. And so actually having both lenses, if we are mostly the recipient, understanding what would help the person we're telling who is the source of the harm, um, may actually help them. But this is from the reference point, if you are the source of a harm related to intolerance, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, PAUSE is a model that we use at UC Davis. Um, if you're told, hey, that didn't go so well. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations, but when I am, I feel a mix of emotions. So the first step that's really helpful is to figure out what you do to slow things down or to pause take a deep breath, say, hey, or if you're in the middle of something, hey, can I come back to you? And make sure you come back to them. Um, what we wanna be is accountable too. When you're ready, it's important if you have unintentionally been the source of harm is to acknowledge the harm that has occurred and accept your role in the cause and the repair of the event. It may require that you take time to understand how and why this was harmful and who it impacted then it is really important to acknowledge that ugh, or other feelings going on, on what you're feeling right now, what you need so that you can lean into the process and be present. The next step is to embrace and explore how you can be part of the solution. So that's one way that we, we, we do um, interactive scenarios where we try and actually implement this, um, but it's been helpful in academic settings to utilize a tool like this and practice it. Um, so everyone's, ready to try and lean in instead of having that reactivity in the moment. But I also wanna acknowledge this does not cover if you are the recipient of harm. And I wanna create space for that too, because that's what we're discussing here. That's been a common core theme. And I think that in those situations, it's really important to make sure you're, you figure out who your network of safe people are, who your agents are, and who are your upstanders? So you don't have to do this alone. It is not, if, if you've been through the harm, I think you can give the gift of letting others know, but it is not your job to fix the harm. Um, I think it's really important that when we approach someone, um, we really try and engage. So um, when it comes to apologies, um, there is a tool by Lewicki, which I think we can share because it's published um, on the steps of offering a repair what it takes and, and it's basically preparation and then step through understanding what was at stake and delivering something that is genuine, not belaboring why you did what you did, but honoring the harm that happened and really sitting with those feelings. Um, I would, like to add very simple trauma-informed care principle that you always focus on 
we don't say what is wrong with you, but we always focus on what wrong happened to you. So that's my principle. And another thing is, if somebody is saying that you, your action, your words or anything has impacted them or hurt them, then that's where the conversation has to start. Being willing to listen rather to than come up and talk like or defend yourself, be open to hearing the other person out. I, I I agree. Before before Oprah popularized it, among communities of color, clinicians would say, "There's nothing wrong with you. What happened to you is wrong. Let's talk about it." I I, I just want to add that um, if we can get to the place that we can appreciate that perhaps that person. This is hard. And it's not always possible. But if we can explore how someone may have been operating out of good intention, if we can find that place in some circumstances, you cannot, it helps these conversations go better. If we cannot, that might be a good time to reach out to the leadership or reach out to um, others to really strategize what would be a meaningful smart response without causing more harm to yourself or to others who are similar, uh, experiencing similar cases. And I just think have a need to say that this is all predicated on being in a relationship. Some people have no desire to be in a relationship with us, and this is for them, this is fruitless. There's nothing they're going to say and do. They're going to say, No, I've made a decision about who you are as a person. I'm going to act on it, and you're not going to convince me otherwise. <clears throat> yeah, and I'd also like to add um, I think this also goes back to the question regarding grief, because I, I think that is, it, it was a great question and there definitely needs to be some space um, to address individual grief, collective grief, especially in light of historical trauma, as we talk about religious intolerance is understanding, um, understanding the harm that has been done almost at the root. And I will bring it back historically to colonization um, as a American Baptist, Haitian American Baptist woman who is seeking ordination, Catholic school educated, raised by parents who were Catholic and converted to Protestantism. I mean, trying to figure out where the harm has been done um, from the hands of missionaries and why I am Baptist. Like, what does that mean? And how do I continue to dwell and to live in a space where harm continues? to happen um, interculturally, interculturally, but to understand, not just academically, but to really learn the history. I think for me, healing does come when there's knowledge, um, but also finding out, well, who wrote this historical book? Like who, I need to make sure I'm learning from, from different from different people. Um, so there's just harm that's done at so many levels, but one way to, um, to think and work through the grief of religions that were lost during colonization, that question is to understand that loss, understand the damage and the harm historically. I think if we can restore that, um, that some wellness and healing can, can come through. And, and would we also suggest, given, um, given everybody's background and the topic today, would we also suggest that at some point that grief and, and pain and can be um, reconciled or at least assuaged through therapy and mental health care. Absolutely. Um, so that. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, therapy is uh, very much uh, warranted because uh, be, healing can come from different parts, right? Different um, directions. It can come from faith, it can come from therapy, it can come from family, it can come from friends. But uh, another piece that I uh, would quickly want to add is like as a cultural psychiatrist, when talking about cultural humility and using the word intolerance, I also feel we still talk about things in terms of tolerance, which is one majority extending tolerance to a minority. 
we have to move away from that to acceptance. When we say acceptance, we we are not, then we are accepting your sexuality, your gender, your faith, your uh, class, your uh, race, your ethnicity, I'm accepting you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the spirit to go forward in is acceptance. And that's where I think therapy plays such an important role. It helps us accept our own self and have that gratitude and acceptance extended to others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can, Thank you. I, yes, please one do. Last thing, that if you are thinking of leaning into mental health, it is okay to be choosy, to find a provider who sees you and values you mm -hmm. and helps you on that journey. And it's okay to change your mind and find someone who will support mm -hmm. you through this process because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. need to be honored. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. And at this, at this point, um, we just have a few minutes left. So I want to ask our participants to please um, click on the link in the chat that my colleague Dominique has posted. Really, really appreciate everybody's um, feedback on our sessions. We use your feedback seriously in planning our programming going forward. Um, I want to just thank our presenters from you know from the the from my heart for sharing yourselves, sharing your perspectives, sharing. Um, such important information, such wisdom. This obviously is a conversation that could go on for a lot longer. Um, in fact, perhaps this could be part one if enough um, people tell us that they want to learn more. There's certainly a lot more that we can explore with regard to mental health um, care and what that might look like. Um, the issue of discrimination across religions and across spirituality needs to really be, um, can be discussed more. So we want to thank you very, very much. Please take a few minutes um, um, and, and thank you presenters ever so much for dedicating your uh, time and helping to plan and then deliver this session. Your, your wisdom and perspectives has been, you know, of great value for us. And let everybody know that within a few days, our um, this recorded session will be available on the Steve Funds YouTube channel, and we are excited that that will make it continuing continuing to be available for people, and you'll be able to share it with others, and we will share it with others through our social media, so that um, more people can 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 be part of it. Um, if there's any other questions that people have. Don't hesitate to send emails to info at stevefund.org and otherwise please visit our website and our knowledge center. We have a broad array of multimedia resources and we are um, growing all the time and we really do appreciate being in touch with all of our with all of our um, our stakeholders. So Pooja, Farha, Sarah, Will, 